just want to talk to you a few minutes. You'll, I'm sure you've already noticed that there's kind of a, a different order. Uh, I wish I could say that I had great hope that we'll be able to go back to uh, less than a virtual hug uh, before the first of the year, but who knows. But until we can and until we do, I, we're going to enjoy this venue and being online as, as much as we can. And I want all of you to do your missionary work. Uh, we are not only live here in this room, but we are live on our webpage on Church Online. By the way, the live streaming service that we're using is uh, the same service that some of the largest churches and ministries uh, in the country use, like Financial Peace University and things like Elevation Church that has, I, I, I don't know how many places they have, but uh, we're grateful to be able to tie into this Christian uh, service. So we're live here, we're live on our webpage, we are live on Facebook, and we are live on YouTube. All four of, of those things. And uh, uh, spread the word uh, amongst those that you know. Just looking at the people that are here, my sense is we have a, a few people less than, than what we had last week, and I know next week is a, is a holiday weekend, and I know some of you are going to enjoy the holiday. God bless you. We're going to have live service right here, and we're going to have live on our website and Facebook and, and YouTube, and you know, if you're on vacation and you've got your phone or your computer, tie into church. You know, that's not an ability you have when you go on vacation and we're not, you know, church online. So uh, we are using the, stream, uh, the, the streaming service called Living as One, and it really is a wonderful name. It does give us the privilege to live as one. Now, we are, again, going to be doing some, some different things. You'll, you'll realize very quickly that the service is being, I'll call it streamlined. We want to take advantage of every moment, and we want to not waste any time because time is precious. And... Uh, Some of you will enjoy the streamlining. Some of you will figure, oh, I'd like to go back to the way, the th the way that, that things used to be. Well, it's probably not going to happen right away. But this morning, I want to finish up this second of the Beatitudes. We're taking this series of sermons that we've entitled Flipped. From Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and the first section of the Sermon on the Mount is called the Beatitudes. It comes from the Latin word to be happy. And this second Beatitude is really telling us how to be happy and blessed and joyful and have an abundant life. Jesus said, or the Bible says, that Jesus said, I am come that you might have a life and have it in abundance. Now, in this second beatitude, where we're looking at Jesus saying, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's really a two-word oxymoron. It's a kind of contradiction, you know, kind of like bitter, sweet. And we talked to you about this last week. Some of the oxymorons that, that we deal with, jumbo shrimp and deafening silence. And then we got to the last one, and I don't want to offend anybody, but government intelligence. <laughs> now, 
really in mourning, the blessing of mourning is in the comfort. And we tried to take talk to talk to you about that. Uh, we talked to you about Elizabeth Elliot, and again, I want to recommend if if you want some phenomenal reading, get Elizabeth Elliot's book Through Gates of Splendor. Uh, by the way, I do want you to know that on the three different platforms, we have hosts in each one of those platforms, and they are on the chat line typing up the notes that, that you see here. And uh, this morning, I want to say to you that there is comfort in seeing ourselves as we really are. Romans 5.12 says, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. We know the Bible teaches all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are living not as God intended and created us to live, but we are living as we are living because of the tragedy of sin. We were created in God's image to know God and to commune with God in, in, in perfect love. But our sin, the sin with which I was born and the sin with which I have committed, has marred that image. Evil and death are not just at work out there somewhere or out there somewhere, but sin and death are at work inside of me. And in mourning, we give ourselves the opportunity to linger on the effects of our sin on others, including God. How often have we talked about that when we see the cross, it just, it's not just a tragedy because of whatever ever anybody else did, but the cross is a tragedy because it was my sin. Not yours, it, me, Ron Bailey, my sin that put him there. Suffering and mourning should draw our attention to the ugliness of sin and its poisonous effects. We mourn the presence, the prevalence, and the power of sin in me. Like the old spiritual says, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mother, not my father, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Now, there's a story in the Old Testament about David. He had a rebellious son by the name of Absalom. And Absalom drove David out of Jerusalem. And the Bible says, David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered, and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too, and were weeping as they went up. That's from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 15 and verse 30. Covering their heads and weeping and, and, and going barefoot were all demonstrations of repentance. Was this tragedy of David being driven out of Jerusalem by his rebellious son the result of the sin of every person who had their head covered and were barefoot and were hunched over and, and, and weeping? No. 
but they were repenting from sin and hating sin in general, the kind of sin that leads to such tragedies as treason, rebellion, and war. You know, I want to share with you from Matthew chapter 7. Uh, this is still part of the Sermon on the Mount. It says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I wouldn't be telling you the truth if I didn't tell you that I'm grieving. But in my grieving, I need to start with the recognition of the presence, the prevalence, and the power of sin, even in my own life. And when I get my life straightened out the way God wants it to, I can see a lot clearer to help others on their way of being strengthened and renewed and loved. You know, we don't often grasp the purposes of a particular event or affliction, but we do understand that suffering exists because evil exists. God promised that death would follow disobedience, and a world of death means a world of suffering. Suffering as the consequence of sin points us back to sin's ugliness. Suffering should prompt us to see our sin as a greater horror than the suffering sin causes. Sin does not directly cause all of our suffering. If we were not sinners, our world would not know suffering. Therefore, regardless of its reasons, both our suffering and that of others should always cause us to hate sin. And I've, I've said for years, you know, when we look at everybody else, we want justice. When we look at ourselves, we want mercy. What we'd be a lot better off to do is when we look at ourselves get ourselves in line with God's justice. And when we look at others, look for mercy. I was listening to a television program this week, late at night, and somebody broke into a song that I've been wanting to hear for years. We used to sing it a long time ago. Mercy rewrote my life. Mercy rewrote my life. I was an outcast, my soul cast down, but mercy rewrote my life. How many know that song? Anybody here know that song? One. Oh, Mary Francis, we got to learn that song. That's a, I know it's an oldie, but it's, it's a goodie because, you know, where would I be if it weren't for mercy? 
You know, a hatred of suffering must really become the hatred of sin. So comfort comes from seeing ourselves as we are. But also through mourning, we see God as he really is. Genesis 6, 6 says, So the Lord was sorry he ever made them and put them on the earth. Sin broke the heart of God. Now, I, I know as parents, we have a measure of, of understanding You know, I, I know when our kids mess up, oh, it's easy to get mad. And when we're done getting mad and done getting frustrated, what do we do? We fall on our knees and we mourn for the hurt and the pain that our kids have gone through. Yep, yeah, maybe they chose, maybe they didn't. Maybe it was their fault. Maybe it wasn't. But we can understand a measure that through mourning, we can see God as he really is. Sin broke the heart of God. I don't think that that's something that can I almost say in the evolvement of, of the gospel message? I'm, I'm not saying that we should, oh, go back to the old days of railing against everybody's sin and everybody's wickedness and shouting and, and, and screaming at them and, you know, like two kids that were in a library and they were uh, stand, uh, sitting there trying to read a book and a couple of tables away, there were a couple of other students reading a book that they ought not to read, and these two Christians stood up and at the top of their lungs in a, in a uh, uh, library yelled at the top of their lungs, sinners, repent! And I'm, I'm not saying we should go back to that. All that does is promote hate. But I am saying we need to recognize and see God as he really is. Sin broke his heart. In the Old Testament, the effect of the nation of Israel's rebellion and rejection of God was to break God's heart. Look, look at the New Testament. Jesus looked at the city of Jerusalem and said, oh, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't. You can understand that as a parent. You can understand that as a relative, your, your nieces or nephews. You want to help them. Please, mother, I'd rather do it myself. No, I want to go my own way. It breaks our heart. And mourning lets us see God as who God really is. God suffered under the faithlessness of his people. Israel's unfaithfulness is comparable to a wife who betrays and rejects her husband Go, go read the whole story of Hosea, you know? God tells Hosea, go to the marketplace, buy this woman, her name is Gomer, and marry her. And he does. And Gomer ends up breaking Hosea's heart. And she goes back to her street walking and goes back to her slavery. 
And God whispers in Hosea's ear, go back. Go back to Gomer. Embrace her. Bring her back home. We need to look at those stories. How, how often, how often have I broken the heart of God? Blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, to some degree, when, when you look at this, even in the story of Hosea, it's got to almost be like trying to hug a porcupine. <laughs> How do you like to have to do that? And yet, God does it for me all the time. We don't understand all the reasons why a good God allows suffering and and evil to continue. But when we look at the God of the Bible and we look at the cross of Jesus, we know what the answer isn't. It can't be that God doesn't love us. It can't be that He is detached or indifferent to our condition. God takes our misery and our suffering so seriously that He was willing to take it all on Himself. There is such deep consolation and strength in that truth to face the sometimes brutal realities of life on earth. God knows and sympathizes with us. It does matter who you are but no matter who you are, God really does feel your pain. He understands and knows the pain of divorce. I've talked to you about this at one of the recent communion celebrations. sitting there at the Last Supper, and he said, somebody's going to betray me, the one that puts his hand in the bowl with me. Here he is ready to die for not just the 12, but for the whole world, and there's one in that select group of 12 that's going to go out and hang themselves. Does Jesus know the pain of divorce? Oh, yes. Rejection? Abandonment, grief, we serve a God who fully understands the pain of a broken heart. Psalm 143, uh, four, 147, 3 says, The Lord heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. We know God heals physically, and let me say clearly, Physical healing is for today. The age of miracles is not over. When will the age of miracles be over? When we are translated into the kingdom of heaven. Then and only then will the age of miracles and healings and all the other gifts of the Spirit be over because they will not be needed anymore. We know God heals physically but he also heals us emotionally. Isaiah 53, 5, by his wounds we are healed. I want to say to you, in time, God will heal your broken heart. I'm not saying there won't be a scar. I've got a scar 
none of you will ever see. As a kid of, I don't know, seven, eight, year, eight nine years old, I was delivering papers and I was on my collecting route and I saw one little sapling grow up like this and I saw another sapling grow up and go like this and I thought, oh, I'm just going to take a rest and brace myself between the two. So I'm up there as a little eight-year-old kid and I'm just looking all around and all of a sudden I heard snap and I was standing on the ground. That tree that went this way I didn't realize it was dead and it broke off and I had this weirdest feeling in my stomach and I had this pain in my leg right here and my hand went in and then I really got scared and I, I, I made it home and you know my parents looked and, and there was a, a gash about that big and about that wide and boy there was a whole gouge taken out of my hip You know, I can scratch that thing and it don't hurt anymore. It doesn't hurt a bit. Oh, there's a scar there. But it doesn't hurt. When your heart is broken, there's going to be a scar. And a scar is a visible reminder of the wound and a testimony to God's healing. God showed his scars to Thomas as a testimony to his victory over death. Someone who's lost a child is never going to be the same. They're changed for life. There will always be a scar, but that doesn't mean there won't be healing. You don't have to forget to be healed. It just doesn't have to hurt anymore. And that's where the comfort is. You know, there are two truths that I know. And here's the first one. We are all broken. All of us. There's nobody in this room that has not been broken by life. All of us are damaged goods. We've got some baggage. Well, maybe not you, but I do. We've all been deeply disappointed. We've all been lied to and taken advantage of. We've all been betrayed, belittled, and abused. We've all been deeply wounded. You know, if you and I were the only two people in a room, just the two of us, and I asked you to tell me your story, your story, the story of who you really are and what you've really been through, uh, including the dark secrets. And you trusted me, and you were willing to be brutally honest with me. The story you would tell me would probably be the story of brokenness and damage and hurt. You say, Pastor, how can you say that? Well, the Bible says so. The Bible teaches we live in a fallen world. A world corrupted by sin. And none of us gets out of this life without being affected by it or unscathed. Not only have we been sinned against, we've sinned against others. I've, I've done some wrong things. I've, I've had to go and say I'm sorry. And like last week, Dr. Sam said, his wife finally said to him, I don't want to hear I'm sorry again. I just want you to change. <laughs> The second truth is this. We all may be damaged, but the second truth is you are loved. 
God is love. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And in, in God's eyes, we're all little children. Oh, I know we want to be, you know. But I want to narrow down on this. God loves the real you. Not just the you that freshens up for church, you know, puts on nice clothes, makes sure they're cleaned and ironed and pressed. And How are you? Oh, great. How are you? God loves the broken you. God loves the dysfunctional you. God loves the addicted you. God loves the compulsive you. God loves the secret you. Do you think he doesn't see? He still loves you. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Height, depth, Things present, things to come, the past, the future, nothing. God loves the real you. God loves you right here, right now, exactly as you are at this moment. I'm not saying, you know, I don't need to make changes or or you don't need to make changes. I'm just saying God loves you right the way you are. And when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit begins the long, patient process of applying the healing medicine of his love to your heart. Romans 5.5, 5, For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. I want to tell you a story that's a really old story, really before my time. But I ran across this illustration, and it just fits so perfectly. In a book entitled, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, Dale Carnegie published a book in 1948. He tells of a woman called Mary Cushman who learned this important truth that God loves you just as you are. The depression of the 1930s all but devastated Mary's family. Her husband's paycheck shrank to $18 a week. Since he was ill, there were many weeks he didn't earn even that much. Mary began to take in laundry and ironing. She dressed her five kids with Salvation Army clothing. At one point, the local grocer to whom they owed $50 accused her 11-year-old son of stealing. That was all Mary could take. Mary said, I couldn't see any hope I shut off my washing machine, took my little five-year-old girl into the bedroom, plugged up the windows with paper and rags. I turned on the gas heater. We had one bedroom, and I didn't light it. As I lay down on the bed with my daughter beside me, she said, Mommy, this is funny. We just got up a little while ago. But I said, never mind. We're going to take a little nap. Then I closed my eyes, listening to the gas escape from the heater. I'll never forget the smell of gas. Suddenly, I heard music. I listened. I had forgotten to turn off the radio in the kitchen. 
but it didn't matter now. But the music kept on, and presently I heard someone singing an old hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. As I listened to that hymn, Mary said, I realized I'd made a terrible and tragic mistake. I'd tried to fight all my terrible battles alone. I jumped up, turned off the gas, opened the door, and raised my windows. Mary went on to explain how she spent the rest of the day giving thanks to God for the blessings she had forgotten. Five healthy children. She promised that she would never be ungrateful again. Her family eventually lost their home, but she never lost her hope. They weathered the depression. Those five children grew up married and had children of their own. Mary said, as I look back on that terrible day when I turned on the gas, I thank God over and over that I woke up in time. What joys I would have missed. How many wonderful years I would have forfeited forever. Whenever I hear now of someone who wants to end their life, I feel like crying out, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. The blackest moments we live through can only last a little time, and then comes the future. You know, we sang a song last night or last week, this is how I fight my battle. And when you read the text of the song beyond this is how I fight my battle, I'm convinced it's taken from the story of the prophet whose servant said to him, Oh, Lord, look at all the enemies that are gathered up on the hill around us. And the prophet said, Oh, Lord, open the young man's eyes. And suddenly the young man opened his eyes and said to the prophet, Oh, wow, those that are with us are more than those that be with them. Hallelujah. And I want to pray for us. Lord, open our eyes. Let us see that in the morning comes joy. There's probably not anybody in here that's not been tempted to give up. Please don't. Never, ever, ever give up. Meditate on Scripture. Sing hymns. Talk to somebody about your hurt. Seek help. Place yourself in a position to be found by hope. Weeping comes. And there will be weeping. There will be mourning. But let it help you to see who God really is. And that in the morning, in the morning comes joy. Darkness comes. But so does the morning, the sunlight. Sadness comes but so does hope. Sorrow may have the night, but it, we cannot let it have our life. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. <laughs>